Uh, That's given you time to turn to the Bible reading, uh, which is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 24. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armour of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armour of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armour on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you'll be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. With every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit, and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough in him to speak as I should. Tychicus, our dearly loved brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing. I'm sending him to you for this very reason, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, One of the people at the West bailed me up and said, "Uh, I see you running many mornings in the week, Bernard. Uh, Why do you run? And I said, I run because I have three meals a day and if I didn't, I'd roll. The reason I run is because I eat. I love running though. Uh, And in days past when I was a little younger, uh, a little slimmer, and when I didn't seem to work on Sundays, uh, I used to do races. Uh, I like long stuff because I'm not real talented, but I like being stubborn. And uh, twice I've run a race in the Blue Mountains called the Six Foot Track. Uh, It goes from the Explorer's Tree near Katoomba through to Janolan Caves. You can work out how long that is. Uh, It's cross country. Uh, It's sensational. Limited to a 1,000 people. And so you've got to get in early. And one of the premier off-road races in the country. Uh, It starts with a mad dash over 150 metres. People gather early and eat damper and drink tea. And so everyone gets hyped up. And then the first 150 metres is this narrow funnel to the top of a really long staircase down into the Megalong Valley. Uh, the staircase is always covered in moss, so you've got to get there early, okay, because you can only run in single file. So it's a madcap dash to that. Uh, once you get to the bottom, it's undulating, and you reach a place called Cox's Creek. Uh, if it's rained recently, uh, they usually string up a rope because it's chest deep, and so you walk across with the rope. And then once you get to the end of that, you then hit two really serious hills, Uh, The first is called the pluviometer, and that really exercises your aerobic capacity. Uh, About 15 kilometres into the race, and the hills go for seven kilometres. Even the leaders walk those hills. And when you get to the top of the second hill, you've still got more than half of the race to go. 24 kilometres to the finish along a ridgeline. And then the end is another madcap dash down a really steep slope, which is covered in slate with really sharp rocks. Now, one year I passed someone who was just sitting by the road. Their legs were red because they'd come a cropper and they'd just slice their legs. Now, the problem for many runners at the six-foot track is that they focus on the next step, what's in front of them, and they forget the big picture. I've just got to get to the staircase first. And then they forget there's still 44 k's to go. And then they get through Cox's Creek and they've still got 30 kilometres to go. Then they get through the seven k's of hills and there's still more than half of the race to go. And so because they forget the big picture, they blow up. Because they forget the big picture, they blow up. You've got to keep the big picture in mind if you're going to finish the race, don't you? Ephesians is a little like the six-foot track. It starts on a high, doesn't it? Remember way back in the mists of time, literally and figuratively, uh, when we started the series? 
Ephesians 1, God's cosmic picture, his plan before time even began to grab a mob for himself through Jesus Christ. That Jesus was the key to the whole universe. Remember how from those cosmic heights that power was exercised in a real man who walked this world and died on the cross for our sins and came back to life to show that that judgment had been paid and he gathered and united and forgave a people and gave them a purpose. Remember how that was then taken into our lounge rooms as we worked out how to walk, those five walking images of Ephesians 4 to 6, right down to what we do in our kitchens. We looked at that last week. At that point in this letter, the temptation for us is very clear. I've just got to make the next step. If we think that way, we've made a mistake because we've forgotten the big picture, haven't we? We've forgotten why that next step is important, why it's significant. The fact that that next step actually echoes eternally. And so that's why Paul finishes the letter this way. Pick your vision up. Don't focus on Cox's Creek. Focus on eternity. The significance of what you will do today at lunch matters. And really when you read through it, it's a roaring call to arms, isn't it? Because we're in a fight. We're in a battle. But we know the outcome. I'm going to read from verse 10 after I've prayed. Dear God, thanks for your word. Help us to listen to this vision of the big picture and apply it in my walk today. Amen. Verse 10, finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. That shouldn't surprise us, point two on the outline. Shouldn't surprise us that he starts his closing section that way because when you look back over chapters four to six, the life of the people of God is not easy, is it? That walk is not easy. Uh, I was reading an author yesterday who was talking about the radical change needed in the everyday life of the Christian. He, He actually said it should scare us with how radically this will put us out of step with the world. We will not walk the same as anyone else if we walk God's way. Uh, That's going to be really tough. It's not going to be possible without help. In fact, it's not going to be possible without God's help, which is why he starts with God and his vast strength. In fact, that's where he talked in chapter 1. Do you remember that prayer? Way back in chapter 1, verses 15 through to 20, 21. Remember there that he prayed that God's mob would know God's power? No secret. No magic formula. No secret cachet of wisdom that we've got to access in a special way. It's just the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that rolled back the stone. The same power that beat the devil the same power that God makes accessible to his people. So as we begin this last section, as we pick our vision up, take it to the one who has already strengthened you, raised Jesus from the dead. And you'll apply it in a certain way, point three on the outline, because of the context. Verse 11, put on the full armour of God so that you can stand against the tactics of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armour of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having prepared everything to take your stand. It's very tempting to just focus on the next step, isn't it? All I've got to do is put left in front of right. It's very easy just to focus on what's in front of us. But if we do that, we're going to lose perspective, aren't we? We're actually going to lose the big picture, the significance of that step. Paul's hinted at that right throughout the letter. If you, if you go back, remember he's in jail, wrote a bunch of people in modern-day Turkey, a bunch of people with a lot of influences and pressures on their identity. He knows them, he loves them, he hasn't seen them for seven years, though he lived with them for two and a bit years. And as he writes to them, he describes God's power right throughout the letter, God's plans, that God always wanted a mob to hang out with him. He achieved that through Jesus Christ. In fact, once Jesus has lived, died and risen, Jesus is now seated where? In the heavens. 
as the ruler of the universe. And who's suited with him? Us. We're there at the dinner table with God. The devil's been defeated. His power has been taken away for eternity. And when he describes that in chapter 3, verse 10, he says, when we gather like this, what are we saying to the world? What are we saying to every spiritual authority across all eternity? When we sit here, we're actually saying to the whole universe, look how wise God is. He can make something out of this mob. He can make people who are enemies and make them united. He can take people who didn't know each other and make them a household. Look how wise God is. That's the plan of God, and it's eternal and cosmic. There's one bloke who doesn't like it, though, isn't there? There's one bloke who doesn't like that plan. There's one bloke who's implacably opposed to every aspect of the plan of God. There is one man who is a sore loser because every person he held on to is now in the household of God. He's lost his grip. What's his name? It's Satan with the devil, isn't it? And he is now directing every part of any considerable power that he might have to one end, to getting you away from the seat at the dinner table with God. That's why God's mob need his strength. That's why God's mob need to have a big perspective. The walk we have as God's mob is a walk under attack. And we will only be strengthened by God if we dress appropriately, if we suit up in the full armour of God. I I remember in Armidale uh, when I was there at uni, me and a mate of mine went for a run. It was the coldest run I've ever been on, minus 16. I had balmy Armidale days. Uh, sleet turned to snow. I, I rocked up for the run. It went out behind the uni and came back in. Uh, I suited up for the run in six layers. I was fine. My mate, he wore a singlet and a pair of shorts. He finished with frostbite. He wasn't dressed appropriately, was he? He didn't suit up. To be strengthened by the power of God is to be suited up, to be dressed appropriately. Now, before we look at that, let let me make two things very clear about that from what we've seen in Ephesians. First, the outcome of the fight is already decided, isn't it? You know what we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10? Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 20 to 21. The outcome is already sorted. Jesus lived the life we couldn't live, so he could die the death we certainly deserve. So he could rise from the dead to say, I have beaten death eternally for you. I've taken your full judgment because I love you. I have met the devil head on and I have taken away his eternal power. And the best image I can think of is the fact that the devil has been beheaded. That's the best kind of snake, isn't it? Now, the body, you can handle that. But do you touch the head straight away? It's still dangerous. It's defeated. Its power has been removed, but it's still dangerous, that head. And that's the devil, a headless snake thrashing around. So be careful. Jesus is already ruling. The outcome eternally is decided we are involved in the very significant mopping up operations. Secondly, as we think about this armour, the confidence is expressed in dependence. The worst kind of soldier is one who thinks they can do it all on their own, who tries to fight the whole war independently. And right throughout this passage, this passage smells, reeks, seeps and oozes dependence, doesn't it? Whose armour is it? It's God's armour. Whose strength is it? It's God's strength. When you finish in verse 18, who are you talking to? God. The whole passage is about dependence. Dependence on the one who's already beaten the devil. And so when we take our battle, not against flesh and blood, verse 12, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens, 
Well, we've met them in chapter 2, 1 to 4, haven't we? And they've been beaten already by the God who loves us, by the God who has great mercy on us. So suit up. Then in verse 13, you must take up the full armour of God so that you can resist in the evil day. That's now to take our stand. Twice the command's given, suit up. Twice the reason is given because you've got a battle against the devil. Twice the war instructions are given, stand. You can't avoid the big picture, can you? You can't avoid the big picture. There is a war going on with a foregone conclusion. Jesus beat the devil at the cross. The devil is thrashing around, employing every scheme and device he has to unseat God's mob from the table. Suit up. That big picture is crucial. That big picture allows us to see the significance of each step. To borrow Russell Crowe's phrase, it echoes into eternity, doesn't it? Every step. Each step we take is actually empowered by his strength. Each step we take has a cosmic significance. I suppose the question is, do we have that perspective? Do we view the next step I take today as being eternally significant? Because if we don't, we've lost sight of the big picture. Our world has lost that perspective. Let me give you three really simple examples. Our world sees a lie and calls it a lie, a white lie, a harmless lie, a little lie. God's mob see the same lie and what do they call it? The tool of the devil. Because that's what we told his powers in, is in lies. God's people see that and see it as an attack on the truth and design of God. What's wrong with a lie? It's an, it's an effort to tear down God's design and desire for truth. They're never little, are they? They're never white. They're the scheme of the devil. Uh, our world sees a tantrum and they call it the terrible twos. God's mob sees a tantrum and remembers Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, raising children to know and love the Lord. Our world sees an affair and calls it true love. God's mob sees an affair and calls it adultery, an active attack on the daily example God has given to show the good news. And that runs right throughout every step, doesn't it? Our daily steps need to have a cosmic perspective. Our daily steps need to have a cosmic and eternal perspective. I I, I don't mind the idea of a battle. Uh, I don't mind personally the idea of the right perspective. But I like to know that what I'm taking into the battle is going to work. You guys are like that, aren't you? If I'm told to put on a suit of armour, I want to know it's going to work. I want to know that that armour is going to do the job. I'm at point four on the outline. If God wants me to wear it, how do I know it will do the job? Isaiah 59, 15, the Lord saw that there was no justice. He was offended. He saw there was no man. He was amazed that there was no one interceding, so his own arm brought salvation. His own righteousness supported him. He, that's God, the Lord, put on righteousness as body armour and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. Isaiah is looking at a broken world in which no human being can deal with sin the blackness, the brokenness, the depravity. And so who steps in? God suits up, doesn't he? Did you see that? God suits up. God puts on this suit of armour and he comes and he judges sin. He deals rightly with the problem of rebellion and he works salvation for his people. It's the very same suit of armour, isn't it? The very same suit of armour. Isaiah 11, verse 5, the belt. Isaiah 52, 6 to 7, the sandals of the gospel. Isaiah 11, verse 4, God's word. 
Isaiah 59, the breastplate and the helmet. The very same suit of armour that God wore. Does it work? Well, there's nothing new about it, is there? There's nothing innovative about it. Nothing secret about it. It was nailed on a cross. And it's given to us bloody and battered and worn and sword damaged and creased and dented. But it works, doesn't it? It works. On the cross, it beat the spiritual forces of evil. That suit of armour works and the gathering today proves it, doesn't it? So what makes up that suit? Oh, it's there in verse 14 and following, isn't it? Again, if you look at that suit of armour, there is nothing new about it. Everything about that suit has already been mentioned in the whole letter. Truth, chapter 113, chapter 5, verse 9. Righteousness, 424 and 59. Gospel, 11336. Faith, 11528. Salvation, 11325. Sword, 113117. It's right throughout the letter, isn't it? Nothing secret. Nothing new, nothing flashy, but every time it's mentioned, those parts of the suit, God's mob are gathered. God's mob are made his household. God's mob changed their postcode. God's mob are seated at the table. Does it work? It's been tested by God. Of course it works. Is it secret? Not secret. It's not a new innovation. It's not a secret wisdom we need to access. It's old, it's tried, it's tested, it's won. It's given to us by God so we remember our complete dependence. Look at verse 18. With every prayer and request, with every prayer and request pray at all times in the Spirit. And stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. It's not a new command. It's actually tied up with putting on the suit of armour. And and if we know what prayer is, and as you heard last year and as you've heard this year, prayer is expressing a complete dependence on God, isn't it? All of the battle must be faced with prayer. A statement that I depend on the one who wore the suit first. The whole book's like that, isn't it? Chapters 1 to 3. Well, you can't get to the walk in the suit if you don't go through one to three, can you? Where God has changed your postcode. Be alert in it, in prayer and in battle. Uh, Who do we pray for? Well, even the greatest apostle in the universe, verse 19. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. For this I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough in him to speak as I should. Who do you pray for? The whole household. The whole household. From the littlest to the one who might be standing up the front. Now before we get to our final point and we think just briefly about a couple of ways to apply this, let me just observe two things about this suit of armour. The first is the whole section is not about individuals. Every personal pronoun... And every verb is plural. It's a household suiting up. It will then affect each individual, but the call to battle is to the household, to the mob. Now, we'll find out in a moment that that has serious implications, but the picture in your mind should be of that Roman tortoise, you know, the one you've seen in Asterix comics, where they click the shields together, put it over the top, and off they go. If one person doesn't click their shielding, what happens to that tortoise? It fails. It is of no use. The battle is faced on an individual level, but the instructions here are to the household. Uh, Let me also observe, too, that this is a suit of armour that isn't just defensive, nor is it just offensive. It's about defence and attack. We've got to take a stand. But if you remember back to what Neil was talking about in Ephesians 5.11, we've got to go out and expose darkness. It's no good just to circle the wagons and hope to survive. We're actually commanded to expose the evil in the world, to go out in the same grace 
that God has given us in Jesus and to expose what the world needs. To do that in such a way that people are snatched from the devil and seated at the table. That's our job. As we put on the full armour of God, do so with confidence. It's tried and tested by God himself. It works. Suit up as a mob, as the household. Suit up not just to circle the wagons and hope to survive, but in confidence exposing evil. Suit up in complete dependence upon God. How did I prepare for the six-foot track? Point five on the outline. I I love running races like that. They give you two types of maps. They give you the topographical, which tells me point A to point B. It's got squiggly lines on it. They don't work for me. That's why I read that with the elevation map. That works for me. You've got to keep the whole race in mind, don't you? Because if you keep the whole race in mind, you have the right perspective and you'll handle all the individual bits. It's the same with us, suiting up. You'll see four suggestions there on your outline at the end. It's got to start with God, doesn't it? It's got to start with him. That's the whole structure of the letter, isn't it? Did you notice that? It starts with God and finishes with God. His suit of armour, his strength that raises Jesus from the dead, our dependence on our requests before him. If we don't start with him first, we're starting wrongly. This is always brought home to me when I look at all the options often laid before Christians in this war against the devil. There are so many books giving us techniques, aren't there? So many books telling us where and when. So many things that offer a secret form of knowledge or a secret way of doing things that we want to tell you. Listen, just open your Bibles and look at what works for God. Look at the way the suit of armour is described and start with him. Because when you start with him, you look at the cross. And when you look at the cross... You look at the triumph of Jesus Christ crucified and enthroned as the king of the universe. And let me tell you, that works. It's also got to start from actually understanding the suit of armour that battle outlined and the victory proclaimed. Where, Where will you find all that stuff, that unavoidable truth? Where will you find that? In the Bible. It's so boring, isn't it? So lacking in innovation. But it works. Where else do you meet God? Where else do you see the cosmic plan before time? Where else do you meet Jesus Christ crucified and raised? Where else do you meet that perspective on life? Where else do you actually see the schemes of the devil called what they are? Where else do you see the quiver of the devil and all the arrows that he wants to fire? Uh, Let me be very blunt. If we are not reading God's word daily, we are ill-equipped. We are not equipped to go into battle. We're not suited up. Let me exhort you to suit up with the word of God. Thirdly, it involves a household. It's not an individual suiting up, is it? Uh, My tendency with something like a passage like this is to individualize. This is about me. It's about the household. It's about the household gathered. That's why the gathering is so important. It's not an option. It's not part of a list of possibilities for this day. It's the gathering of the army for the battle. It's a priority. Because if one soldier is missing from the Roman tortoise, so who's not gathered? Have we looked? Have we come early in order to meet the others gathering? Have we looked around and gone, which soldier is missing and maybe hurt? Have we looked for the members of the household and exhorted and encouraged them today by talking with them? Which one of the household members, the fellow members, might be encouraged by reading the word of God with me this week or you this week? What questions will we share over morning tea as we suit up? Together, finally. It's always to be a dependent fight, isn't it? 
That's why it finishes with prayer. That's why it finishes by tying this whole suit together by being dependent on the one who has the suit and tested it for us. God has met the enemy. God has beheaded him at the cross. How foolish would it be to go in a battle without praying? So I suppose the last question is, when were we such a dependent household? When was the last time we gathered for prayer? so that we were suited up, dependent for battle. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. It is so marvellous to be reminded that the very same strength that took Jesus from the tomb is now working in us. It is so wonderful to know that you've already tested the suit of armour you hold out for us. It is so reassuring that I do not have to take the next daily step with cosmic significance without talking to you. Father, thank you for the dependence we can have on you for our salvation and our perseverance. Please make us a suited up, dependent people. Amen. Any quick questions? Like Neil and then Roz. Uh, what's at stake if we do or don't suit up? Yeah, what's at stake if we do or don't suit up? That's a good question, Neil. Uh, I think there are cosmic and eternal consequences, aren't there? So just think through some of the passages we've looked at over the last few weeks, which are where we're meant to suit up in our day-to-day life as a household. If we don't follow that pattern of husband and wife laid out in the Bible, what happens to the daily example of the gospel that God's put in our community. Disappears, doesn't it? Uh, If we don't take seriously the way in which we are to be children and fathers explicitly and parents, then what happens eternally? If we don't live as people who work to the Lord, what happens eternally in our workplaces? So I think asking those questions takes us back and goes, well, God's actually given us a very clear job here. It's three things. Fellowship with him, and as you fellowship with him, you'll grow in the household image. As you do that, go out and bring others into the household. Tell them about Jesus. And thirdly, represent God and his plans in such a way that evil is exposed. So if I don't suit up, those three things suffer, don't they? Now, the easy way out of that is, well, God's sovereign and he'll do it anyway. Well, he wouldn't have given us Ephesians to read, would he? There's actually a very clear call there. We have to be confidently and dependently responsible to respond. That's as far as I go at this point. Does that answer your question? Terrific. For the recording, Neil's nodding his head. Roz. Yep. 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 So Roz is asking a question about uh, verse 12. So he's used the whole, th- uh, right throughout the book, he's used the concept heavenly realms. But here he talks about the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Uh, I think he's really at this last point trying to draw home some of the threads he's established. So he, he made it clear in Ephesians 2 1 to, 1 to 3 what we're dealing with which are the powers that decide and set themselves up in opposition to God. They're not just here and now. They're cosmic, eternal, which is what the word heavens is picking up. So he's talking about the fact that there is a a cosmic, eternal and spiritual effort to set up something against God. And we're involved in dealing with that in our day-to-day life. And so we've got to keep that big picture in mind. What does that look like? Uh, On one level, I was chatting about it with someone last night. We've got to take, for want of a better phrase, the spiritual realm seriously. 
Life is not just what you can touch, taste, smell and feel. There is a spiritual aspect to life that is significant and life is connected with that. So the two are inseparable. And so we've got to realise that what we do physically is spiritual in its consequence. And there is a, a force that is wanting to set up an alternative to God and it is evil. Deal with it. So that's as far as I'd go. Roz, does that give a bit of an answer? Yeah, terrific. Uh, Pete? All right. So Pete's asked two questions. How do we expose evil? And is it to expose evil in the church and or in the public realm? Is that have I got your question? How do we expose evil? Uh, the first way we expose evil is walk as we are. Living is not passive. When you live the walk you have as a member of the household of God, you will automatically expose the world around you. Secondly, when we expose evil, we're actually confronting the alternative presented to God in the world. We will do that with the same grace that Jesus did with people he was dealing with. So it'll be clear, get behind me, Satan. G'day, Peter, how you going? Peter, I restore you and you are now part of leading the new church. So there's that truth expressed in love, in relationship. So I think that's at least those two. And where does that expose evil? It exposes evil everywhere. So you've got to call it out within the church. And so I think that's part of suiting up together as a household in loving relationship. We've got to call sin out amongst us in love. Don't be shrill about it. Don't be gossipy about it. Do it face to face. But we also got to call sin out in the world out there. Does that answer your question? Terrific. Thanks, Pete.